very good evening to all of you. And uh, we are ready to commence uh, the panel discussion on well-being in the cyber age. Let me introduce the panelists today at the panel discussion. Professor Priyanjali Disoiza, clinical psychologist, faculty of medicine, University of Colombo. Mr. Jayanta Fernando, chairman of the National Center for Cybersecurity, director and legal advisor of uh, in ICT. And we have Dr. Kasun Disoiza with us, a senior lecturer of University of Colombo School of Computing who's also an expert on cybersecurity. So meanwhile, uh, we already had a few sessions and I have with me the questions that uh, you gave from each of your groups, two from each group. So let me start with the first question and uh, that would be from group number one. Um, with regards to the topic was uh, on cyberbullying. So let me start with the first question and I'll be um, giving out this question to Mr. Jayanta Fernando as uh, this is probably related to social uh, media and also your privacy information. The question being, uh, why social network asks for privacy information and do not keep them private? Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to come together uh, at this session um, and I congratulate the University of Colombo in the first instance for hosting the uh, Asia Pacific event of this magnitude, uh, bringing all eminent universities together. Uh, in terms of the uh, session, I think it's uh, in the context of modern day technology and its use, uh, I think we need to congratulate the participants and the organizers for uh, this particular session uh, looking at the well-being in the cyber age. So thank you for doing that. Uh, to get straight into your question, uh, uh, basically uh, uh, from the moderator about uh, the, the privacy measures built in into social media and whether they will be honored or not. Uh, it's a very interesting issue and a challenge because simply that uh, we all know uh, when we look at the platform services and the services we use in the social media domain, uh, when we uh, in the first instance register <coughs> using our tab or mobile or whatever to be a user, we enter, we tick off terms and conditions uh, under which we agree to carry out certain functions vis-a-vis -vis that platform. So there is a contractual relationship created between the user and the provider of that service. And within the terms and conditions, you have privacy and other safeguards built in. But often what happens is that it's one-way traffic. One-way traffic in this sense, I mean, not to put any blame on anybody, but it so happens that if we abuse or if we misuse our rights and obligations, within the framework of that contract we enter into with the provider of that platform or the solution provider, the solution provider can take us out. They can give us some kind of warning, kind of signals to say that we are either behaving or misbehaving. That happens. But when it comes to our privacy and whether they would keep to the privacy commitments that we sign off. And sometimes we can go to the settings and enhance our privacy uh, to decide whether we want to share certain information only with family, with a, with a very close friends group or the public at large. You can control all that. However, the bottom line is that uh, I have seen that most social media platforms or absolutely all of them would like to respect that. However, we know that there are instances where things are, matters are beyond their control 
and there is breach. There are wide scale breaches happening, and we know all of them in the recent times. Uh, Kasun can talk a little about it, and the social media breaches have resulted in uh, profiles, details of profiles, upload information, and even passbook, uh, passwords details of our account information uh, going outside the control of the operator, what we call data breach incidents. Now, because of the fact that some countries and jurisdictions where these operators basically have their main offices, either they are incorporated in the state of California and they have a large office perhaps in Brussels or Ireland or some other European destination, and they are governed by rules and regulations that require disclosure, that br breach is notified with a worldwide announcement and the customer is sometimes notified. But what I have noticed, at least in cases that I have seen in South Asia, our users who have suffered a breach are not specifically notified. So the curing of the damage is done uh, uh, by that company because they have a social responsibility to do it. Very often they do it in a very nice way so that we don't get scared about what has happened. But in terms of whether they will keep to the commitments is not just a contract issue, it's a technology issue. And I think perhaps uh, Kasun can take over from there and explain the technology challenges in running those platforms, which makes it impossible sometimes for them to keep to the contractual obligations the platform provider enters into with us to keep to the privacy obligations that we have signed up. All right, we are moving on to the next question. With the time, I have to pick the best out of the best, as uh, the next question would be on telehealth. Is it possible that patients opt for the telehealth instead of giving to the hospital, going to the hospital rather, even in some dangerous cases? I would like to uh, point out the question to Professor Priyanjali Di Sorry, sir. So telehealth services were actually uh, started in for rural communities initially. So for example, if say in countries where there's a wide geographical area and you can't access, people can't access health services, you could provide health services from the central hospital through the internet. So for example, if there are no hospitals outside of Colombo, from the national hospital, we might be able to provide some kinds of consultations to people living in rural villages, provided that they also have a computer or a smartphone or a Wi-Fi connection. However, if the patient needs surgical operations, clearly you can't do it through telehealth services. It's just a consultation. Now, the dangerous cases come to somebody, for example, suicidal or homicidal. So would they then not go for a face-to-face -face consultation and instead want to connect with somebody through the telehealth portal? It can happen. It can happen due to many reasons. But the positive is at least they're connected. Through even a dangerous case, they're connected through some portal. And if the person is suicidal or homicidal, once a connection is made, with the central hospital or a health consultant, they can then decide what to do with that person. So it doesn't mean that just because somebody's dangerous, they will opt only to go for telehealth. Mostly people do want to get into a face-to-face -face consultation. So this kind of situation is very rare. Just hope you received the answer for the question. Group number three? Yes. And uh, then I'm going for the question by group number four. Uh, this is uh, to Dr. Kazun Desai, sir. Can AI tech detect ident or identify depressing words or pictures like they do on hashtags or comments or posts without invading privacy? I think it's just coming into that. Thank you. Uh, uh, so first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to this session. Uh, so the question is, uh, can kind of we 
mine the data or can can you actually could identify uh, whatever the personal emotional things uh, based on their images uh, without going for privacy uh, breaches uh, that that question is kind of it's it's depend like for example when you when you post the photos uh, so they people might post those images maybe you post it maybe someone else post it uh, but some situations perhaps yes so I these posts may violate your privacy because it shows your emotional levels in which stage and so on but in sometimes uh, you may post it maybe uh, but it's uh, for the f uh, whatever the social networks but whether it violates your privacy or not depend on how kind of you define the privacy because for me I personally feel some information is private for me some other person might think it's no it's it's, it's a public kind of uh, and the main thing what I would like to highlight there is if someone concerned on the privacy which connect to the first question as well so technology always there uh, to kind of pr protect the cyber security plus to do the data mining and things like that. So for in order to use those technologies, so the as, the as you are the users, you provide the information. So, so when you provide those information, you need to be kind of uh, thoughtful uh, which information or which photos, which things you provide to them and which is not provided to them. So obviously if we want to identify emotions, there should be a lot of pictures with those emotional kind of activities. Uh, so that uh, to my, per my personal view on that question is yes, so it may violate your privacy. Uh, so that not a problem of this technology company who provide the service. I personally feel it's a problem of you because you are the people who are posting those photos. So, so when you post the photos or whatever to the cyberspace, you have to be think twice. Why? Because in the cyberspace, there are no delete button. So some people think you in post this, and then if you don't want, you can remove that. It's not so. So after you post it, first thing the tech, those companies, even though you say delete, they are not deleting it. They are just not giving it to you back. The second, some other social networking company or some of your friends or maybe a search engine may take a copy of those. And they will be cash kind of forever. Uh, so, kind of, so I personally feel we should not post the pictures uh, to the network, private pictures, kind of like a personal matters, like uh, emotional pictures kind of things, we should not post to the social networks. So, I first feel some people posting the pictures where even just look at those pictures, Everybody feels this is kind of a not a good picture to post it because when you put post something on the internet, it's a public. Public means anybody can see that. Even you think it's only you share with your friends. So that is for this particular moment. Maybe someone may hack into the system. Someone maybe that company may without your knowledge, even you have the license agreements and so on. Without your knowledge, they may sell it. Without your knowledge, they may use those photos for the AI, as, as they said, the mining task. So because of that, uh, the young students here, I advise, so be careful when you use social networks, especially posting images, because they might use for the purpose which they not supposed to. So then my personal conclusion, conclusion of this question is, Yes, it's kind of violate the
privacy. Which means we cannot totally rely on artificial intelligence when it comes to this kind of uh, issues. Uh, so we, we, the artificial intelligence uh, will continue on the data sets. So these data sets usually provide by the end users. So if end users think about not to provide that, then in the future I don't think that will work kind of. Thank you, Dr. Kasun. And uh, the next question would be to Mr. Jayanta. To which extent should we allow private businesses to utilize technologies to detect inappropriate materials? Uh, sorry, in terms of uh, uh, to what extent we will allow the private entities to detect? Um, private businesses to utilize technologies to detect uh, inappropriate materials. Uh, th that's a bit of a that's a very interesting question, no doubt. It's very general in the context of allowing uh, private organizations to uh, do analytics in a way, right? Business organizations to uh, look at the... Yeah, private businesses. Uh, to look at the... Uh, to utilize technologies to detect inappropriate materials. To which extent should we allow private inappropriate businesses? Inappropriate behavior. Now, when you say detect inappropriate behavior uh, inappropriate inappropriate behavior in Sri Lanka will not be inappropriate in another country or appropriate behavior here will be inappropriate behavior in another country so it all depends from which in what country's context this should be looked at and whether a private entity can be hired by a social media platform or some other entity to look at uh, what constitutes inappropriate behavior. Uh, some or some of the largest social media platforms, even those who are originating from Asia Pacific region, from the large countries in Asian region, are known to be hiring private entities to do systematic intelligence of behavior patterns uh, based on a certain criteria that originates from a particular country. So for example, uh, we had in our country uh, a scenario uh, one and a half years ago where social media platforms were galvanized or used as a channel for uh, you know, to, for incitement to violence, uh, uh, racist posting and that kind of stuff. Now, in that kind of situation, there was actually a violent crime, incitement to violence, uh, all constituting criminal behavior. And it was, not, it was not possible for my agency and the law enforcement agency to detect and take down, and we had to go into a social media blackout for a few days because of the fact that we wanted to give it a, an analytical platform to assess the situation. Now, in that scenario, some operators provided tools that came from uh, private sector hired entities outside Sri Lanka to do analytics based on certain parameters that were set by us and our law enforcement team that would constitute wrongful behavior. So it all depends how the permissions are given. Uh, who authorizes it? Is it through a court order? Or is it through a governmental request to a social media platform that facilitates that? All depends on the norms and the conditions that constitute misbehavior or wrongful behavior as defined by the laws of respective countries. And to conclude that point, what I want to emphasize is that internationally this has become a challenge because uh, all these social media platforms that we use uh, and which are to our advantage also, uh, don't originate from our part of the world. They originate from the Western hemisphere. It's their origin. So their social norms tend to be the community standards, but sometimes they customize it to a local scenario based on 
what constitutes wrongful behavior in a country. So some platforms have been very adaptive, but what I have to say is there is no international set guideline and this subject is evolving. And in that context, I think that question is very good. Thank you. And uh, moving on to the next question, and that would be for uh, Dr. Um, Professor Priyanjali uh, This is regarding um, between internet addiction and underlying psychiatric disorders, which comes first, which leads to other? Well, internet addiction disorder is not considered a disorder up to now, but they're considering it making it a disorder. So for example, the addictions that we have as a disorder is alcohol use, tobacco, mm, dangerous drugs like heroin, and we also have gambling as a behavioral addiction. So now they are considering making internet use as well as gaming also an addiction if you go beyond a t particular number of hours, but they are considering it. Why are they considering it still? Because they don't know whether it is a symptom of a mental illness or whether it is an illness. So this question, there is still no answer. Uh, mental health professionals like psychologists, psychiatrists, sociologists, you know, in related professions, we are still going to do research to find out whether if you are your use of internet for so many hours, if you can't live without internet connection, if you're thinking and dreaming about internet connection, you know, and if you get kind of withdrawal symptoms when you don't have internet connection, whether you can be diagnosed as a mental illness and whether you should go in for treatment. We still don't know whether it's that or whether if you have depression or anxiety, then you go into internet and that is a symptom of a mental illness. So there is no answer to this yet. All right, and uh, moving on to another question by the group number five, and this will be to Dr. Kazun Desaisa. What's the current law enforcement regarding punishment of the production and consumption of child abuse materials respectively, and how effective is it? Okay, actually should go to Jayanta, he's a lawyer. I, I, I should get the technical questions. Yeah, right, so we'll move on to Dr. Jayanta. <laughs> Yes, uh, the law enforcement. Uh, punishment for? Regarding punishment of the production and consumption of child abuse materials. Yeah, so uh, very interestingly that uh, question comes at a time when Sri Lanka was in the process of amending the law when there was a change recently in the government and I hope they will take those laws forward. We have at the moment laws pending in parliament uh, dealing with uh, new offenses created with regard to uh, child abuse material and that kind of abusive, uh, 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 you know, uh, revenge porn and that kind of area. We have got laws in place. Uh, we have got laws before parliament, not yet in place, uh, yet to be enacted. And those criminalize and impose strict penalties. Uh, but in terms of mere possession, of such material, uh, the law is such that there is, I think, a criminal penalty of five years imprisonment, uh, uh, but, uh, but I think that law is not yet approved by parliament. But what I can emphasize is that we have another law in 2006, which was enforced fairly strictly uh, recently, uh, requiring all internet cafes to ensure, internet providers to ensure, and internet cafes and those who provide even uh, internet service in a university to make sure that that service is not used uh, for the purposes of promoting or obtaining child pornography related material. So we have laws and there is a criminal penalty of uh, three to five year duration that is uh, possible to be imposed by court upon conviction. So merely providing a service or facilitating the providing of a service is deemed to be an offense in that area, but mere possession of material, that law is still pending parliament. Thank you, and uh, getting to Dr. Kazun Desaisa, and this would be on a safety concern. How can the information security of patients acquired through the telehealth be guaranteed? Okay, uh, so, so question uh, is about kind of how, how do you 
after the collect the information from any health or medical uh, hospitals or whatever, how do we guarantee that? Uh, so that is may not misuse, right? Uh, so basically, as you may aware, there are um, cryptographic technologies available, the mathematical methods, what we call it as cryptography, available there we could convert those information to the un, uh, unreadable formats what we call it as encrypted data or the cipher data so we could store them in the encrypted format uh, in those databases or the data storages and in the then in the database levels we could make sure we could give uh, correct access rights to those correct people uh, not only that for we could provide the better authentication mechanisms to access those systems. Usually the present we do usernames and the passwords, but there are more advanced authentication techniques, what we call as two-factor authentication, three-factor authentication, and so on. So we could provide them. In order to provide those security measurements, first of all, when we collect the information, we need to categorize them into the levels of kind of confidentiality, like which data is more important or confidential, which is unclassified uh, kind of categories. So then we should not apply the technology blindly to protect all information. Instead, we categorize them and apply the more security measurements to more classified information and then and so on. So obviously there are technologies uh, to make sure after someone gather your medical data uh, to protect it in this medical database. There are special research areas going on medical health or medical informatics, security on medical health or me informatics and health uh, data. So especially uh, maybe some of you know in the Europe they have recently introduced a privacy law called GDPR where they are very concerned on that. So if some institute collect your data and somehow for some hacker, let's say some hacker get into uh, these systems in that hospital and take it that, so the total responsibility now goes to the organization. So if organization collect the information, so organization should get the responsibility and all the technology measures to protect it. If not, they have to pay a huge fine. Otherwise, they have to, they have should not collect it. Other thing what we can, uh, what we recommend as a technology experts, so after we collect the data, we should not keep that forever. So we, we have to think about which data need, which medical information which need to preserve and which one we don't need. So the data we don't need, immediately we have to kind of erase or kind of dispose or not to, not to store. So that's what we should do. So that's also covered by this GDPR. It clearly say you should not store the data forever for anybody. So we keep the data as we need it, after that we erase it, remove that. Well, with that uh, we conclude the uh, panel discussion on well-being in the cyber age. I would like to thank Professor Priyanjali D. Soisa, clinical psychologist, faculty of medicine, University of Colombo, and Mr. Jayanta Fernando, chairman of National Center for Cyber Security, director in uh, legal adv and legal advisor on ICT, and Dr. Kazun De Soisa, senior lecturer of uh, University of Colombo School of Computing, for joining and probably getting you the technical know-how when it comes to the well-being in this cyber age. Not just the technical know-how, but what you were in, uh, like the questions that you raised in your group discussions. Probably hope that you received the answers that you were seeking for. So thank you once again, Professor, Doctor, and uh, Mr. Jantha as well for joining it. Thank you. panelists could remain on stage for a moment um, to receive their tokens of appreciation.
and first to Professor Priyanjali Desai, sir, clinical psychologist, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. Then uh, to Mr. Jayanta Fernando, Chairman of the National Center for Cybersecurity. Mr. Uh, Dr. Kasun Desaiza, Senior Lecturer of University of Colombo School of Computing for joining the panel discussion. Thank you once again.